So, this is called the Why I'm a Fool series, and the reason why I call it that is because if I know the answer to something and I do the wrong thing anyway and I hurt myself, but I'm a fool. And the Word of God, He gives us answers for just about everything in life, and when we don't do what it says and we get into trouble, we're foolish. It is foolish. Hey, Laura, good to see you. There are a lot of good people on here tonight. So, last week we delved into, and by the way, we're going through the book of Proverbs loosely in this study, if you haven't paid attention, and we're up to Proverbs chapter 2. Anyway, last week we started a, a new um, edition, The Secret to Happiness. So you would think, gee, everyone would want to know, you think there'd be a million people listening to this. You know, because it's not a joke, people. It really is true. You know, I'm not. This is not clickbait. This is real. The secret to happiness. Well, this is part two because I never gave you the secret to happiness. I did give you the secret to, to sorrow. Okay, and uh, when we spoke about it, we can see how how we all fall into that. But let's just review. So last week we ran out of time, and we ran out of time discussing. Um, our biggest waste of time in life. If you're a human and you've been around a while, you've wasted time with this one thing, which is what? Getting people to like us, getting people to love us, getting people to respect us, and getting people to follow us. No matter who you are, deep down, it's what you want. You want people to like you, you want people to love you, you want people to respect you, and you want people to follow you. I mean, there might be some kook out there who wants people to hate them, uh, but for the most part, even those who want people to hate them really want that because they want people to like them. It's really uh, something that's deep into psychology of the human. Um, but anyway, we found last week that when we live that way, and, and we start when we're in you know, the sandbox. It starts in the sandbox. It's, it's where it starts, as little kids. Okay? You, you do things bad sometimes so people will pay attention, right? Any reaction, any attention is good attention because we want to be noticed. Many young people, children, when they're young, uh, in their uh, developmental years, their formative years, um, uh, and they say in psychological terms that, believe it or not, by the age of five, uh, your personality is already pretty well formed uh, by the time you're 13, it's 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 locked in stone, and you know we become uh, those people just older. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, we haven't changed so much since we were teenagers. You know, me and Sally often joke joke around a lot about, um, you know, I I'm just an 18 year old in a 58 year old body. Uh, you know. A lot of the same things make me happy. I, I still want to do some of the same things, but I'm smart enough to not do them anymore. Uh, but anyway, so we realize that when we live our life constantly wanting people to approve of us and like us, well, it leaves us tired, angry, and sad. That's just the way it does. And you know why? What do we learn? Because we can't convince people to love something that we're still trying to convince ourselves that we love, right? Many of us have really low self-esteem about who we are. Many of us don't like ourselves. You might think you do, but really we're always trying to compensate. And when we try to get people to like us and love us, well, we're really trying to convince ourselves that we're even worthy of it because we're not sure. We're not sure if we're even lovable. Okay, and we we determine by how many people like us and approve us. We use that as the gauge to decide how good we are, and how important we are, and how lovable we are. And if no one likes us, we get angry at those people because they have proven ourselves. Now they have proven to us what we have feared all along that there is something wrong with us. So instead of blaming us, we blame them and say they are no good because they don't see what I'm trying to find in myself. 
But anyway, let's get back to, uh, hey, Laura Jean and hi, Madeline. Good to see you guys. Uh, amen. That's wonderful. Uh, so let's get back to this secret, finding answers to it. And uh, we found some important clues. And these are the scriptures that we're going to work with tonight. Again, uh, I know I said Proverbs 2. It's actually Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, New Living Translation. We're just going after these four scriptures. One, my child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commandments in your heart, for they will give you a long and satisfying life. Never let loyalty and kindness get away from you. Wear them like a necklace. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and man. Wow! Favor with both God and man, and you will gain a good reputation. Right? What's that song? Don't care a damn about my own reputation. Something like that. Something like that. Uh, we say we don't care about our reputation. We do. Peer pressure doesn't end at 13. It takes you to the... You know what? Just go to a nursing home. There's peer pressure there. Everybody wants to be liked. There's still a little... It's a microcosm of society. People, that's what we do. We interact with other people. We bounce things off. And our emotions are like hypersensitive, and we're we're determining what people are thinking about us when we really don't know what they're thinking about us. Anyway, what was the conclusion that we came up with last week? Well, the conclusion was this: we need to stop trying to sell ourselves. Why? Because we can't sell a product that we know is flawed. And we think that if everyone buys the product, which is us, it'll prove to us what we don't want to know, that we are Floyd. And we feel that if we can sell enough of us, we can prove to ourselves that we are as good as we hope we are, even though we know we're not. But what happens? Sooner or later, people find out the truth about us. And all of our selling will be proven a lie. And if there's anybody out there who's thinking, no, 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 that's not me. I don't, I don't care what people think. Uh, I'm not, well, I did a little experiment this past Sunday. I told everybody that secretly I've been recording conversations that you have been having privately at home, in the bathroom, in your car. I put little bugs there. And I'm going to be picking a person and playing it on social media for everybody to hear. Uh, would anybody feel comfortable with that? Would, they, any, would anybody feel, say, fine, I have nothing to hide. Whatever I've said, you can take any conversation I've had anywhere, put it on the media, no problem here. I don't think there's one person who would want that. Because immediately you'll be going, which conversation did he hear? What was I saying? Where was I? Okay, why are we so concerned? Because people might not like us anymore when they see what we really say and think, right? You know it's true, people. Well, that's where we left off last week, and it was a cliffhanger of cliffhangers. And again, it left us at this point that if selling us is never going to bring us happiness, then what will? What will bring us happiness? It, you know, I can't sell myself anymore. I've been trying to. No one wants to give me any, any cash for me. I'm not worth anything. Uh, but you know what I mean. You know what? We're trying to get that justification that I am somebody. I am important. My opinion matters. My feelings matter. And when people hurt us or don't respond the way we think they should, uh, we take it personally and we walk away devastated uh, never admitting that someone could say something that hurts us so much. We say, oh, doesn't bother me. No problem here. I don't care what anybody... But that is one of the biggest lies. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. Okay? That's not true. The, re I mean, the fact is, just you having to say that proves that it's a problem. If you have to say that, it means you care. Well, anyway, I'm going to uh, quote someone, okay? Anybody remember Al Gore? Al Gore was once the vice president when Bill Clinton was president, and then he ran for president. And uh, uh, 
he wrote a book. It was actually a movie he put out later on. And uh, the only thing I'm taking from this guy is the title of the movie, okay? And that is An Inconvenient Truth, okay? And I, and I always love that phrase, an inconvenient truth. Now, though I don't, I'm not saying what I agree or disagree about the movie, that's not the point, but I did like the title. Because what does it mean, an inconvenient truth? It means there's a truth about this issue that we struggle with each day. It's always been there. We can't avoid it. We won't like the truth. In fact, we hate the truth about this. Even more, most likely, when you hear the truth, you will deny it and you will never follow it. But yet, the truth remains the same. Makes me think of a Led Zeppelin song, right? The song remains the same. The truth remains the same as this truth never changes. Okay? It is static in time. Okay, well, what is that all-elusive truth about personal happiness? What is it then? Well, let's go back to our scriptures, and let's see what this truth promises to bring first. So we can see, is it even worth going after this truth? And I think when you read what the truth promises, you have to say, gee, I would like that truth. I would like that promise, okay? And then maybe you might embrace it, but I doubt that we will, because we have personality problems. We all do. Don't forget, guys, I'm going to say it each week. If you haven't gotten that book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness by Timothy Keller, um, you're missing a great book, a little booklet, like 40 pages. you got to read it 20 times. Change your life. It is such an important topic. It's actually what we're talking about tonight. But anyway, let's, let's go to Proverbs chapter 3 again, and let's dissect this and see if we come up with anything here. Okay, Proverbs 3, 1. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Okay, by interpretation, this is uh, King Solomon talking to one of his children, one of his sons. By application, it's God talking to all of us about God's wisdom, and he's telling us, I have given you commandments. I have given you words to live by. And in verse 2 says, They will give you a long and satisfying life. Wow, who doesn't want a long and satisfying life? But what are these words that God has told us? Okay? Verse 3, Never let loyalty and kindness get away from you. Wear them like a necklace Write them deep within your heart. It means wherever you go, you take these truths with you. You live as a person who is loyal and kind. But there's more. Because this people, this is where we make the mistake. Because up to this point we'll say, well that's me, I try to be loyal, and I try to be kind. But I get dirt for it. Well, that's where our problem is. Yes, we all, I mean, I don't think there's anyone who would say, you know, uh, are you loyal? No, I'm, I'm very unloyal. I'm an unloyal person. No, we, we all think we're very loyal, and we all think we're very kind, right? So we all agree that this is something good, loyalty and kindness. But the problem is, is we use them for the wrong reason. We use kindness and loyalty, again, to gain people to us. We use those things to get people to like us and say, look at how hardworking, how loyal, how wonderful that person is. But what happens? It leaves us miserable and broken. Again, why? Because... We do this for them, but they don't do it in return. I tell you, it is that, hey Mike, how you doing tonight? Great to have you. If there is one complaint I get after 20 years of mental health counseling, emotional counseling, marriage and family counseling, all different type of counseling, one of the biggest responses and complaints I get from people, they tell me, I have done this for 
such and such. I have done that. And they didn't do it for me. And when I needed them, they didn't respond. Meaning that, well, what was the reason why you did nice things to person A, B, C, or D? Was it simply because that's who you are? Or because you had an ulterior motive? You were building a case that if you needed them, they would return the favor. And when people don't return the favor, we get angry because they didn't do to us what we did to them. And we have to ask ourselves, boy, well, what type of person does that make me then? I think it makes me a user. Do you know I use people all the time? It's part of my nature as a human. Be nice to the people who can do nice things back to me. I find this happening many times in the business world, and I hate it when it happens, and I catch myself, and I apologize. Uh, you know, if I know someone in the auto body business, I send them a lot of work. Uh, I tell everybody about them. And one day I was thinking, because God was really convicting me, gee, why are you promoting person A so much? Is it because you're going to need some auto body work on your car? And uh, they'll take care of you because you took care of them. And boy, what a revelation. What a revelation God taught me that day. I am manipulating people, places, and things for my own agenda. I do it every day. And one of them is that people will like me and love me. Matter of fact, that's one of the prayers I, I came up with. You know, in my daily prayers to God, I say every day, I say, God, forgive me for manipulating people and places and things for my own personal agenda, for my own head, for my own ego, because I want people to like me. And when they don't, and it backfires, I'm angry, because I feel like I got shortchanged in the deal. But why did I, you know, I, I wouldn't feel shortchanged if I didn't expect anything in return. And that's our problem. We expect to get back what we give. Well, that just makes you somebody who just does something with an agenda. You see, God doesn't do things to get things back. He gives love because He is love. He brings peace because He is peace. He doesn't have an agenda other than loving us, saving us, bringing us unto himself. But we always have an agenda. And when that agenda is exposed, we're miserable, sad, and unhappy. Okay? And people, you know, will complain. If you don't jump for them, they'll say, Hey, remember what I did for you? Remember how I gave you that thing for free? Well, where's my kickback? Right? Sometimes we look at God like he's some type of a mob boss. You know, you know, you, uh, you take care of me, I'll take care of you, God, okay? One hand washes the other, and both hands wash the face. i give you a little money on Sunday, and uh, I'll pop in on Christmas and Easter, and, uh, you know, when I need something, I want you to be there for me. You know, anyway, if you have that relationship with God, you cannot be in love with him, Okay? You could be in need of Him. Isn't that interesting? You could be in need of God and not love God. Can you be in need of someone and not love them? Well, it happens all times in relationships. All the time. Okay? I was just talking to somebody today about uh, a situation. A young man met a lady who has a couple of young children. And what happens? Okay? What happens? Okay? It's human nature. We try to find someone to take us out of a situation, to save us. And we might not necessarily love that person, but we see an opportunity for them to be good for us. This person would be good in my life. Not, would I be good for them? Imagine if, if everyone went into a relationship with that, with that idea. I'm going to marry this person. I'm going to be in a relationship with them. Because I will be good for them. Not this codependency. You know, I, I'm so tired of that term, codependency. People love to turn, you know, throw terms around like bipolar. You know, everybody's bipolar today. Everybody's codependent. You know what? We have to watch these, these terms. We throw them around. 
Uh, we could just end all those terms by saying, you know what the problem is? We're sinners. That's the problem. And we love ourselves more than we love God. And we want people to love us. Okay? We want people to love us. And we seek self-approval by their approval. Anyway, so where do we go from here? Okay? I think we've made a couple of important points. Uh, we understand that this, this way we live, this cycle, it makes us angry. Well, then what is the inconvenient truth that this scripture in Proverbs 3 is trying to say? Well, first let's, let's talk about what it promises to give us. What does God promise to give us if we use his instruction properly? Well, verse 4 says, Then you will find favor with both God and people. Wow. Wow. I want that. I want favor with God, and I want favor with people. And look at even more, and you will gain a good reputation. Wow, I mean, that sounds like something I would like. But again, the answer is found first by, number one, stop selling yourself through your goodness. Don't sell your, don't use your goodness to gain. Instead, you ready? Sell the only one that is truly worthy to emulate. See, people, and if you were here Sunday morning, we really got into this. Big time. Okay? I don't teach a lot of happy up-up sermons. I teach a lot of heavy-duty stuff because you guys don't need fluff. We don't live in a fluffy world. We live in a rough world. And you know what? Balloons and lollipops are not going to get you across the street. Facts and truth are, and that's what you need. So I tell it like it is, and you can hate the truth, you can hate me, but you're still going to live in your misery. So, what is the secret to happiness? Stop selling you and start selling Jesus Christ. Show off Jesus Christ in your life. Tell people about Jesus Christ. Act like Jesus Christ. Be an example of him. Well, oh, I don't know about that. People are going to think I'm, uh, I'm kind of crazy. Well, you know what? We go through all of our lives saying, I did this, and I did that, and look at me, and look at my kids, and look at this, and look at that, and I'm this, and I know that, and mine's bigger than yours, and I'm faster than you, and I can lift up more than you. That's our whole life, people. Okay? Especially if you hang out a bunch of, with a bunch of guys, you know, that's what us guys do. You know, you tell somebody, my car has 350 horsepower. Well, my car has 400 horsepower. So there. Okay? You know what? We live competing with one another, selling one another, and it leaves us always miserable. Why? Because we're always going to come up short. But if you sell God, he never comes up short. Which brings us back to the scripture. Let's go back to the scripture and look at it in its totality. Let's start from Proverbs 3 to verse 4. Okay, so, my child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store the commandments in your heart. God the Creator is saying, listen to what I say. You don't want to do it? That's your, that's your call. God never forces. He offers us the golden ring, and you can choose to take it. Well, you can say, no, I will do it my way. Isn't that what the fall of man was all about? God says, go this way, you'll have peace and joy for the rest of your life. Go this way, and you won't. Okay? It's just the way it is. And there's always somebody whispering in our ear. Okay? Choose this way. Choose this way. And it's always, you know how I know when I'm going the wrong way? It's the easy way. I know when I'm going in the wrong direction when it's, Way too easy to go there. Because the right way is always the hard way. Okay? It's always the hard way, people. But let's get back to this here. Proverbs 3. Oh, I, I wanted to uh, mention something. Somebody posted something. Um, only dead fish 
go with the tide. I saw that on social media, and I thought, that's profound. Only dead fish flow with the tide. Okay? If you're alive, and you're looking for truth, you're going to have to go against the tide. Because the tide is taking you out. It's taking you out. It's going to roll you around. And if you've ever been in a riptide, if you've ever had undertow, it's going to take you up. It has nothing good waiting for you. The ocean comes out. It grabs you, and it pulls you back into itself. Okay? But those who swim against it are those who want to live. Because when we give up and we lay on our backs, it's just going to take us and beat the crud out of us. So let's get back to this scripture here. Okay? My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commandments in your heart. For they will give you a long and satisfying life. Okay? So God is already setting up a protocol here. He's making some pretty outlandish promises. And they sounded pretty good. And then he gives us this. Verse uh, three, never let loyalty and kindness get away from you. Wear them like a necklace, write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and man, and you will gain a good reputation. What does that mean? God's perfection lives through us when we are examples of his perfection. Your loyalty and kindness should point people to God, not to you or me. Because we want it to point to, look how good I am. That's what religion does. Religion, if, if you want to feel good about yourself, join a religion. Because all you have to do is dot your eyes and cross your T's and give up chocolate for a week and, and turn your head, you know, three, three different ways on Friday and... Don't eat this, don't do that, give up that, drop some money in the plate, and you're good to go. And then you feel good about yourself. But that's not what God says. God's perfection lives through our example of His perfection. Meaning, promote Him in everything you do. In all of the issues and life circumstances you find yourself, Promote God. And you know what? When you promote God, God's going to promote you. Meaning God will lift you up to others when you lift him up to others. The Bible says, let no man praise himself, but let God praise you. How many times, you know, and this is a problem that we have, and people, you have to understand, there's a fine line between pride. Okay, you have to understand this, okay? Okay. I'm not saying that we can't be proud of our children, our car, our house, our family, okay? That's, we can be proud, but who gets the praise? Is it what God did, or is it what we did? Did you ever see those stickers on the back of a car? My child was on a student at middle country school, whatever, okay? And people, you know, wear them on the back of their cars proudly. Wow, your child was an honest dude. Why do you say that for? Because look at me. I was one heck of a parent. Okay? You know, you know, we live vicariously. You know what that word vicarious means? You know, gaining through another's uh, efforts or pain. We, you know, how many times is it we screw up and we live through our children? Sometimes there are parents... Every time you see them, have you seen what my kid did? Here's a picture of them. Look at what they did. Look what they did. Look what, okay, I got it. You got great kids. What does that mean? What, well, does it mean you're a great parent? You know, all that does is bring me to you. And if we're just bringing people to people, we're not bringing them to God. And what does the Bible say? We, we spoke about this in depth. If you want to listen to the study, I mean, uh, I was really happy with this study. I learned a lot about it Sunday night. Maybe Sally can put it up. Okay, who to trust. And we spoke about, okay, God is a jealous God. And that sounds really strange. He won't have any gods before him, even us. And if we live our lives selling us, then we care not for him. 
because you might get the pat on the back on how wonderful you are and your kids and, and, your, and your home and your lawn is the best lawn on the block. Okay? And it's okay to have those things. But brag people, if we love someone, we brag on them. We brag. When was the last time you bragged on God? Well, you know what? We don't. And this is interesting. It goes back to us loving ourselves. Well, if I brag on God, people are going to not like me. They're going to think I'm silly, I'm stupid, I'm dumb. Gee, so what does that mean? Back again, we care more about what people think about us than we do what they think about God, who gives us all, all things to richly enjoy. The Bible says God gives us all things richly to enjoy. If you're on Facebook here, so I'll just put up that link, uh, the Sunday night service, who to trust. I would really put the time in and listen to that study. Uh, really, really important, especially in this day and age that we live. You've got to know who to trust. And you know what? We're putting too much trust in each other, too much trust in people, too much trust in leaders. We've got to put trust in the only one who is trustworthy. But getting back, I'm getting off on a tangent here. Promote God. Try it. Okay? Be like George Costanza from Seinfeld. Remember that episode when he did the opposite all day? Right? He spent his whole life doing one thing, eating, you know, chicken salad on white bread. And nothing ever went well. So one day he says, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to have tuna on whole wheat toasted. I'm going to do the opposite. And as silly as it sounds, if we're doing the same thing every day, all of our lives, getting the same results that are leaving us miserable and bitter, why not try doing something opposite? Why not start selling or promoting the one who loves you more than anything else? And I tell you, I'm going to use this from now on. I told you uh, last week in our hardball uh, group that I have with young adults that I meet with, uh, one young man came up with a brilliant statement. He concluded that the one who knows the worst about him loves him the most. And I was like, wow, that's good, my friend, because that's the truth. You see, God doesn't hate us, and he knows everything about us. You know, people in our lives, if they knew the truth about us, would they still love us and like us? If they really knew what we thought about them? If, we, if, if they really knew what goes in our minds? No. God knows everything. And he is still sold out a thousand percent. People, I don't know anyone who loves that way. Because all of us have a limit. You know, you, you look at your spouse. Well, what would cause you to get a divorce? Well, probably if I had an affair, I think my wife would leave me. Maybe she wouldn't. Maybe she would be understanding. But I'm sure I could do something that would, you know, uh, that would just have her say, you know what, I'm done. Matter of fact, funny thing came up. I was talking to somebody at, uh, at church uh, from church here, and I forgot how the conversation came up, but I asked them, I said, would there any, be anything I can do that would have you hate me and want me out of the church and just, uh, what would it be that pushed you over the limit? And, uh, and they thought about it, and they said, well, you know what, Pastor, I really love you, and I you know what, I could probably forgive you for a lot of stuff, and especially if you confessed it, but I think if I found out that you would have an affair with someone, I don't think I could put up with that. I think that would have to be it if I found that you were involved in some really bad, perverted thing. And um, I thought that was interesting, and rightly so. They should feel that way. And the point that I'm making here, people, is that People have limits to their love for us. I don't care who they are. God doesn't. Yet we promote ourselves, we promote people, and we don't promote the one who will never turn his back on us. He knows. Man, people, that frightens me, but also gives me joy that God knows the deepest, most disturbing, disgusting things in my head. And he loves me. I just posted, I think it was today I posted, um, I had a revelation. God uses me despite me. 
not to spite me, but despite in who spite, I am, in spite, of yeah, in spite of me. Did I post that right? Did I get it right when I posted? I don't know. I have to check that. <laughs> despite me. But it's true. I, I'm offering on God. Why do you keep using me? I'm such a wretch. I am such a loser. I am so bad. Yet God uses me despite who I am. And it blows my mind. That's grace. That's God's mercy. That the one who knows the most loves us the most. And he will do what's necessary. You see, God tells the truth. God will say, you know what? That dress looks horrendous. That outfit is disgusting. Don't go out like that. Okay? A good friend will tell you the truth. Because they care more about what's best for you than you liking what you say to them. People, these are hard things to think about. And I know when I teach, I make people really uncomfortable. Because we talk about things you're not supposed to talk about. But that's the problem. We don't talk about these things. And listen, self-esteem, our self-esteem is only where it needs to be when we see ourselves through God's eyes, through living examples of God. And when we do, we gain happiness. Because I no longer worry if people like me. I no longer have to worry if people accept me. I no longer have to be concerned if they approve of what I said and what I wore and what I did and how I looked. Because I only need the approval of one. I need the approval of God. Now, I know a lot of people take that term, and this is where we screw this up, because it goes down to our wretchedness again. People like it when you say, you know, if you post something and you say, you know what, I don't care what anybody thinks, I only care what God thinks, and the heck with everyone else. But the problem is, you know what, what's flawed about that statement? We think that God thinks that we're perfect. That's the problem with that statement. That, you know what, God knows I'm perfect, and I don't care if you don't see it. No, God knows you're not perfect. And yet he loves you anyway. So don't throw that quote out there. Yeah, I don't care. Or we should get to the point where it doesn't matter what people think. But we should matter. Or we should be concerned about what God thinks. And if you're truthful to yourself, to your own self, be true, you know you have a lot to work on. I know I have a lot to work on. Uh, what did Dawn say here? Uh, there is no subject that should not be discussed in a sermon. We need to hear the truth. Yes, that's that's true. And uh, yeah, that's probably why the Center Reach Bible Church will never be a mega church uh, because it, it's it's too painful. <laughs> uh, like I say, you know what? There's a truth train, and it's heading to Jesus Christ. And not that many people want to get on the truth train because the truth train uh, makes you tip. Well, you have to purchase one ticket. And the ticket to get on the truth train is humility of spirit. Truly wanting to know, not what's wrong with everyone else, but what's wrong with me. So as we, you know, as we start to wind this down, we lived our whole lives selling ourselves, worrying about what this one thinks or that one thinks. Okay? And we are miserable. Because we never live up to anybody's, to everybody's standards. You know, there's always, you know, in a given day, there's always someone who doesn't like you. Doesn't that bother you? I know with me, you know, I, I, you know, I'm getting better with it. But you know, as a pastor, you know, I have these, you know, I have days where everyone loves me, you know, everyone hates me, and I'm popular, then I'm not popular. Uh, who's coming? Who's going? Boy, it 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 puts you on an emotional roller coaster that is based on not anything to do with God. It has, it has to do with, with self and determining my worth by other people's opinions. Now, if their opinion, now this is where the, the important part comes, if their opinion is true, that if I think I'm that great, well, then I should take their opinion and say, thank you. You taught me something about myself I did not know. And... I'm probably going to take this one to the grave with me. Uh, um, I'm going to have a big long list on my tombstone of things that I want to say. 
one of the things I'm going to want to say is I tried to get people to be honest and humble. And I tried it by living the example. People, you don't know what you're missing by saying, you know what? I got some trouble. I have some soul issues. I shared just Sunday night, and you'll hear it in that study. Uh, you know, as I grow in Christ, I learn, and I change, and uh, I've, I've learned that I've been I've been wrong on a couple of things, and I've and I've changed my prayer life even just the last couple of days, and I started a new direction in my prayers, and that is instead of giving God this punch list of all these things that I that He has to do. Uh, is is to admit, you know what? I don't even know. I'm not smart enough to know what I need. I'm not smart enough to know where I need to go or do. And I started saying, God, this is what I want. And you know how I know this is true? Because it's what Solomon prayed. God, give me the wisdom to know right from wrong. And God, correct me of all my errors. I've been praying that. And God's been... Going, okay, I'll roll up my sleeves. You want me to correct you of all your errors? Well, I'm going to start. And he's been showing me so many things. Okay? I say, God, I'm, I don't want to pray about them or this or that. I want to get me right. Show me. Expose every flawed part of me so I could look at it and say, okay, that's a problem. Let's cut it off. That's a problem. Let's cut it off. And when we chip away at those things, you know what's left? A beautiful example of Jesus Christ to sell to the world. Not to say, oh, look at Pastor God, and he's gained some super, you know, personality. No, no, because if that ends up being that, then I haven't gained anything. I don't want to be me. I want to be like Jesus Christ, and I'm never going to be like him, certainly not in this life, but I can start. And it starts with not asking God to zap everyone who's done me wrong and to zap those who don't see how great I am. But God, zap me. Zap me. Fix what's wrong with me. There's enough there to keep me busy. Okay? There's enough to keep me busy. And yes, and I, and I think it is in the book of, uh, in the book of James where, you know what, we pray and we don't receive prayers because we ask amiss that we might consume it on our lusts. Think about all the prayers we pray. God, I want this. God, I want that. I want this person to love me. I want this thing. I want that thing. We want everything to consume upon our lusts, not thinking that those things, those very things we pray for might destroy us. I think there's an old country western song, uh, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Someone wrote that song. Yeah, I thank God for not answering a lot of prayers that I prayed over the years. Because I will not, I'm not smart enough to know what's best for me. If you think you know what's best for you, then you're God. You really are a God unto yourself. That's what religion is. It's making a set of rules that man has made to determine how good man is. But man's not that smart. Mankind can't correct man. A sinner can't correct, you know, can't tell a sinner what's wrong with them. Okay? We've got to say, God, I am not that smart. Show me my errors. The Bible says that, it says that judgment begins at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what shall it be for the rest of the world? Okay? Goth Brooks, thank you. By Dawn, you're like a star. You're like a star there. Yeah, <laughs> Goth Brooks did the song. Okay, uh, thank God for unanswered prayer. Uh, people, I know this was a heavy study. I see some new people joining on. Hey, Kelly, Marianne, thank you guys for joining us. Um, I know this is heavy-hitting stuff, but I just offer this to you, and I ask you, just consider, what if... What's really going to bring us joy is the one thing we are never going to attempt because it's too hard. Who's the fool? Where the fool? Where the fool? 
And we can't say, God, I am miserable because of my kids. I am miserable because of my spouse. I am miserable because of my country. I'm miserable because of this. I'm miserable because of my neighbors. And I'm miserable because of my church. And I'm miserable because of that person. And I'm miserable because of this co-worker. People, we need to be first be miserable about us. And when we can see us, you know, what does the Bible say? You know what? You can't tell anybody what's wrong with them until you see what's wrong with you. Okay? It starts with that. And God, when we live a righteous, good life to bring other people to reflect to Him, God's going to reflect that glory right back on us. You will find favor. Yeah? And you might find some people that hate you because you talk about God. You know, that's a fact. But so be it. That means that you, that you just poke them in a place that they needed to be poked. And that's good. Okay? If we're affecting people and making them feel uncomfortable, you know, that sometimes I, I think, you know what, God? You know what? If I make people feel uncomfortable because I've been uncomfortable with myself and, you know what, and it makes them stir in their pews, well, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe some will leave. Maybe some will go for gentler waters that will tickle ears. But, you know what? What are we looking for? The Bible says to hear one thing. Not how everyone thought you were wonderful, but from God the Father. And what are those words? Well done, good and faithful servant. What is a good and faithful servant of God? Glorify God in everything. The chief end of man is to glorify God. You want to be good? Be good, but be good for God. You want to raise kids good? Do it, but do it for God. You want to have a cool car? You know, I got a Jeep. You know what? Everything I do, my cars, my Jeeps, all the big boy toys that I have, they have a purpose. They have to glorify God. And you know what? At the end, I have a good time too. And God always blesses those vehicles and those things that I use for His glory. Is there a cost? Yeah, people make fun of me. I got... I got Jesus on my hot rod. I got, I got Jesus on my Jeep. And some people think it's odd. And they might not like me. But that's okay. I'm there to glorify God, not myself. Well, I think I'm hearing music and it's getting louder. That means I'm rambling. <laughs> and that means it's time to end the show. Thank you, everyone. Uh, for being with us tonight and uh, next week we'll have a new topic a surprise topic and uh, we'll tell you about it when we get there so take care, God bless and uh, we'll see you soon <laughs>